Your Honor, Madam Chief Justice, Honorable Associate Justices, good afternoon and may it please the Court. My presentation focuses on a set of challenges on the constitutionality of various provisions of the RH law, grounded on claims that the law violates freedom of religion and freedom of speech. Number one, it is argued that the RH law violates the Constitution insofar as it penalizes the refusal of health service providers to perform RH services or provide information on RH. What Section 23, Paragraph A, Number 1 of the law penalizes is the act of intentionally providing incorrect information regarding RH programs and services. The government submits that no one, not even those who object to the law on religious grounds, has a constitutional right to intentionally provide incorrect information. To grant immunity for such act is to give license to the religious objector to potentially inflict harm on a patient who relies on incorrect information intentionally given. Once religion cannot be used as a justification for inflicting injury on a fellow citizen and transforming innocent patients into victims. The law is reasonable in another regard in the sense that it recognizes the right of those who oppose on religious grounds to conscientiously object. This opt-out provision is a significant state concession to an objecting citizen's religious belief. It allows her to keep silent in the face of an inquiry by a patient regarding RH services and information. Section 23, paragraph A, number one, is a penal provision of a health legislation regulating the responsibility of healthcare professionals towards their patients. It has no speech component and therefore cannot be subjected to a facial challenge. Number two, section 23, paragraph A, number two of the RH law, penalizes the refusal of a healthcare service provider to perform legal and medically safe RH procedures on the ground that spousal consent was not obtained. It also provides that in case of disagreement, the decision of the one undergoing the procedure shall prevail. Petitioner Couples for Christ Foundation argues that the law violates freedom of religion, quote, as it confers upon the wife sole authority to decide on matters relating to her reproductive health in disregard of their Catholic faith, which gives a husband authority to decide in cases of marital deadlock pursuant to God's divine order for the family as set out in the Holy Bible, unquote. What the law recognizes is the constitutional right to liberty and privacy of either the husband or the wife to undergo an RH procedure. It is gender neutral and therefore does not discriminate against the husband or the wife. On the other hand, petitioner's argument that it is the husband who has the sole authority to decide on RH procedures not only violates the liberty and privacy rights of women, it also violates the Equal Protection Clause and the specific constitutional policy recognizing the fundamental equality before the law of women and men. What Petitioner Couples for Christ Foundation wants is for men not only to have the right to undergo RH procedures such as vasectomy, even without the knowledge of their wives, but also the right to override the decision of their wives to have ligation. This is not only unfair, it is also unconstitutional. Such belief cannot be translated into public policy without violating the non-establishment clause. Section 23, paragraph A, number two, is a penal provision imposing a responsibility on healthcare professionals not to discriminate against women. It has no speech component and therefore cannot be subjected to a facial challenge. Number three, petitioners question the constitutionality of the RH law insofar as it requires the conscientious objector to immediately refer the person seeking such care and services to another health care service provider within the same facility or one which is conveniently accessible. It is argued that the duty to refer is unconstitutional because it compels a conscientious objector to become a party to an act forbidden by his faith. The government rejects the argument that the duty to refer infringes an objector's free speech rights. The refusal to perform one's professional duty cannot be considered protected, sorry, protected speech because the refusal to refer cannot be equated simply with the communication of an idea. It is an act that creates a victim in the form of a patient who is denied access to RH information or service. Implicit in the duty to refer is a carefully balanced compromise between, on one hand, 
the interests of the religious objector who is allowed to keep her silence but is required to refer, and on the other, the citizen who needs access to information and who has the right to expect that the healthcare professional in front of her will act professionally. The Honorable Court should view the duty to refer in the context of the fact that a hospital or any other healthcare environment is not considered a public forum for purposes of applying free speech or free exercise doctrines. A person who visits a hospital is looking for a person of science, not a theologian. She therefore expects expert medical advice, not religious instruction or political debate. At the same time, a healthcare provider working at a hospital or a clinic presents herself to patients not as a religious healer, but as a skilled technician trained in the various disciplines of medicine. The duty to refer is also not a civic duty. It is not a political duty imposed on a citizen such as the requirement to salute a flag or fight a war. It is a professional duty imposed on a medical professional acting as such. The RH law therefore simply manages the reasonable expectations of patients as well as the public expectations about the duties of healthcare professionals. If, as in People versus Judge Veneration, an officer of the court can be required to impose the proper penalty, including death, despite his religious objections, with more reason a healthcare service provider can be required to perform the lesser duty of referring a patient he himself does not want to serve. Whatever burden is placed on the free exercise rights of the conscientious objector is minimal because the duty to refer is limited, number one, in duration. The objector has no duty to refer when she is not working as a health worker. Number two, in location. The law regulates only those places devoted to health care. And number three, in impact. The law does not prevent the objector from speaking against the RH law in all other forums. There is also a constitutional challenge to Section 15 of the law requiring marriage license applicants to receive information on responsible parenthood, family planning, breastfeeding, and infant nutrition. In the first place, no one knows the form in which this information and instructions will eventually be disseminated, whether in the form of a seminar or a lecture or a paper or a CD handout. This honorable court, therefore, cannot rule on the constitutionality of Section 15 by anticipating the form in which this information drive is going to be implemented. In the second place, there is a clear rational relationship between marriage and the requirement to receive information on various aspects of marriage, an important component of which is the need for a heightened sensitivity about the responsibilities attached to parenthood. In much the same way that the government can theoretically require prospective spouses to receive information on financial management, it can require the same set of spouses to learn more about the burdens of parenthood. In the third place, those who object to RH information can totally reject information they do not agree with. They therefore retain the freedom to decide on matters of family life without the intervention of the state. Number five, petitioners question the constitutionality of section 14 of the law, providing for age and development appropriate RH education to be taught to adolescents by adequately, tra adequately trained teachers in subjects such as values formation, knowledge and skills in self-protection against discrimination, sexual abuse and violence against women and children, gender-based violence, teen pregnancy, responsible parenthood, among others. What is important to highlight here, Your Honors, is the crucial fact that, that the curriculum and age and development appropriate RH education still has to be formulated by the Department of Education. And because the law has not yet been implemented, the curriculum which may be the basis for a constitutional challenge has not yet been crafted. This honorable court has no jurisdiction to rule on the constitutionality of a provision of the law that exists only at the level of policy and whose actual content has not yet been written. Petitioners also argue that this policy on age and development appropriate RH education already violates the natural and primary right and duty of parents in the rearing of the youth for civic efficiency and the development of moral character. Note that the operative word in the Constitution is the word primary, which indicates that this parental right is not exclusive. This is understandable because parents are stewards 
not owners of their children. Also, attached to this right is another operative word, duty. And this powerful concept is the traditional constitutional justification for the state as parents patriae to participate in the affairs of its citizens, especially the youth. The primary right and duty of parents towards their children can reasonably coexist with the state's interest in building a nation of citizens who are simultaneously civic-minded, morally responsible, and properly informed. Number six, some petitioners also challenge Section 17 of the law, which encourages private and non-government RH care service entities to provide annually at least 48 hours of pro bono RH care service to indigent women. They argue that in the guise of encouraging RH services, the law is compulsory given that the 48-hour hour annual pro bono services shall be included as a prerequisite in the accreditation under the PhilHealth. The law is not as insidious as petitioners present it. For one, the government can in fact condition the grant of a privilege, accreditation under the PhilHealth, with the rendition of some public service such as the performance of free RH service. For another, and more important, the range of RH care services enumerated in the law is broad enough to cover pro bono services by a professional who also happens to be a conscientious objector. Under the law, RH care covers family planning and information, maternal, infant, child health and nutrition, including breastfeeding, prevention, treatment, management of HIV, AIDS, and sexual, sexually transmitted infections, elimination of violence against women and children, treatment of breast and reproductive tract cancers. Surely some of these services must be acceptable to even the most ardent of objectors. The broad definition of RH care means that the medical professionals can pick and choose those RH services that are not incompatible with their beliefs. Your Honors, allow me to end with some remarks about the procedural and substantive posture of this litigation. First, the Honorable Court does not have jurisdiction over the question whether hormonal contraceptives and IUDs violate the right to life of the unborn. This is because the RH law is not the law that makes it possible for Filipinos to obtain access to hormonal contraceptives and IUDs. That law is RA 4729, a 1966 statute that predates our present constitution and whose constitutionality is not in question here. Those who drafted the 1987 Constitution did not intend to nullify RA 4729, and petitioners themselves are not questioning the constitutionality of that law. Second, the narrow constitutional question before us is whether the government can subsidize access to devices that are already available in the market and can be bought in drugstores all over the country. The answer is clear. It is impossible to nullify a government social welfare program that, among others, only seeks to provide willing beneficiaries access to devices that are already accessible to those who can afford. Third, an on-its-face challenge against the RH law is a conceptual impossibility because, number one, the law textually corresponds to the guarantees of the Constitution. Number two, it is not related to speech in a public forum. The RH law is unrelated to the suppression of speech because it does not regulate the political and religious conversations among citizens. What it regulates is the relationship between medical practitioners and their patients. In conclusion, the government submits that the RH law is a carefully balanced statute that takes into consideration many constitutional concerns, including the free speech and free exercise rights of the petitioners. What petitioners generally insist, however, is for the Honorable Court to view this law from a single constitutional lens, the perspective of the religious objector. We submit that this cannot be done in this case without doing violence to the values and intersecting constitutional policies that are implicated in the social question of what to do with the reproductive health of Filipinos. Thank you.